Museum. I'm John Lothrop. I'm the curator of archaeology. And we are standing next to uh, one of the most iconic exhibits. We're in the Native Peoples Exhibit Hall. And this particular exhibit is called Ice Age Hunters. And it portrays the lives and lifeways of the earliest peoples to come into the New York region. Archaeologists call these people Paleo-Indians. And we believe that they came into the region about 13,000 years ago in the latter stage of the Ice Age. And what I'd like to do today is to talk to you about the interpretive elements of this exhibit, but then talk to you about the archaeology and the artifacts of the particular site that it's based on. It's actually based on an excavation the New York State Museum did in the 1960s at the West Athens Hill site in the Middle Hudson Valley. And we have with us here the, art, the artifacts from that site uh, which, uh, mo which, on which the interpretations were largely based. So perhaps what we can do is uh, start by uh, talking about some of the interpretations presented here in the exhibit. And then we'll take you behind the scenes and actually look at the artifacts from the West Athens Hill site. So uh, we're looking at a family, and they're on the top of West Athens Hill. And uh, when I walk by this exhibit, when I'm strolling through the museum, the first thing that draws my attention is actually not the people themselves, but the landscape that they're living in. Uh, they're on top of West Athens Hill, and you see a couple of small scrubby birch trees uh, to their right. And then in the background, in the valley bottom of the Hudson Valley uh, behind them, what you're looking at is what you might call the spruce parkland. Uh, and it's a, a mix of spruce and birch trees. Uh, and there's patches of, of open space as well. And so when they were on this hilltop, they had quite a vista of the Hudson Valley. And that spruce parkland landscape, that's a direct consequence of the climate that these people were living in. They're still in the Ice Age. 13,000 years ago, by that time, the Laurentide ice sheet had retreated north of the uh, northern boundary of New York State, retreated into Canada, Ontario, and Quebec. Uh, and so New York, the New York region was ice free, but they were still, these people were encountering an Ice Age environment, essentially a subarctic environment. Uh, in which uh, the summers were cool and the winters were bitterly cold. And uh, uh, a reflection of that um, climate also is the animals uh, that were uh, present in eastern New York at that time. Uh, most of us uh, know about the uh, uh, Coho's Mastodon, the mascot of the New York State Museum, which has been radiocarbon dated to 13,000 years ago. About the same time this site, West Athens Hill, was uh, occupied. But uh, in addition, there were other animals that are no longer extinct, like mastodons, but they live today in northern latitudes of Canada and Alaska, like this uh, caribou that in this scene has been killed and is in the process of being butchered. Uh, bones of caribou have been found in paleontological sites in New York. Uh, and bones of caribou have been also been found at uh, early Paleo-Indian sites elsewhere, not in New York, but in adjacent regions. So archaeologists believe that this animal probably figured prominently in their lifeways. Unlike white-tailed deer, they were migratory and moved in herds with the seasons moving north and south across New York and other states. If you uh, think further about that climate, this subarctic climate these people are living in. You look at what they're wearing, they're wearing animal skins. Uh, uh, and, and we believe that these people may have been hunting caribou not just for their meat, but also for their skins. Because uh, when winter came as it was approaching in this fall scene, if you did not have warm skin clothing, uh, you were going to freeze to death. So. Uh, animal hide formed the basis of skin clothing, we believe, for these people and probably for tents as well. Um, uh, they're a small group, uh, probably a family, and we think that these people were moving from one campsite to the next across the New York region seasonally uh, in small groups. And the last thing I'd like to draw your attention to is the man on the left. He's an older man. 
and he's making stone tools. Uh, he's actually making fluted point stone weapons tips that they hafted onto their hunting weaponry. And that's uh, an, a major reason that these people were probably visiting the West Athens Hill site. It's a hilltop that is made of a fine-grained rock that geologists call chert. It's a specific variety called Norman Skill chert. It's usually green to gray. And um, as they were exploring the region, they would have discovered this, uh, the presence of this stone that they could make stone tools out of uh, very quickly. And that's probably something that drew these people to this location uh, perhaps every year. So what I'd like to do now is segue into looking at the artifacts that were actually found at the West Athens Hill site that formed the basis of many of the, in the interpretations that you see in this exhibit. So if you, <coughs> excuse me, if you are a hunter-gatherer in the Ice Age of New York 13,000 years ago, literally in addition to warm clothing, uh, in, in fact the first thing that is key to your survival is stone tools because of the sharp uh, working edges that you could create by flaking that stone with by percussion flaking and creating not just uh, stone tips for hunting weaponry but also uh, for other kinds of tools that they would have been using at this campsite. So how do you get that stone? Well if the hilltop itself is made of stone, you're at the right place, but you've got to extract that stone so that you can uh, then turn it into tools. So the kinds of implements that they would have used were big glacial cobbles like this, which they could have gotten from uh, uh, streams below West Athens Hill. And you might use what's called a stone wedge, which has a flaked sharp edge on it, and you could place that stone wedge on the bedrock and then strike it with this big hammer stone and literally break out and pry out uh, massive pieces of chert that you could then reduce uh, using smaller hammer stones like this and knocking big flakes off of uh, to, uh, uh, and these would be called blanks, which could then be turned into tools. So. These are examples of some of the flake blanks that they had been knocking off at this quarry encampment. Uh, now there are really two kinds of tools that they were producing at West Athens Hill. And the first one was what we call bifaces. They're flaked on both sides of the artifact. And the intended end product were fluted points, the stone tips to their hunting weaponry. And so what we have here is that sequence, examples of that sequence of reduction from a big flake of chert uh, to a, a more refined biface and eventually a fluted point. So they started out with a hammer stone, knocking flakes off around the edge of the tool and then flipped it over and did the same thing. And over time, uh, as that process proceeded, the bifaces became smaller and more well-formed and more finely flaked. Um, the manufacturing process was, was not without problems. Making a fluted point is an extremely difficult procedure. And what often happened during the manufacturing process is that a biface might break. So here's an example where the flint napper tried to drive a flake off from the end of this biface. It hinged through and broke the biface in half and he probably swore and threw it away and started over again. So there's a lot of uh, examples of uh, misbegotten artifacts that broke in manufacturing. Um, and here are examples of finished and nearly finished fluted points. And what they all have is, if you look closely, uh, there's a narrow uh, scar or flake scar that's been driven off on both sides of each point. And that's called a channel scar. And the purpose of that is to allow the point to be hafted. So I'm holding a replica of those fluted points, and it's been thinned on the bottom with a channel flake. And it can then be inserted in a split four shaft, which would probably then be attached to a longer hunting weapon shaft. And this could have been used as a, a thrusting spear or a javelin, or it could have been used uh, propelled as a dart shaft with what's called a throwing stick. Uh, 
which is a technology that many hunter-gatherers use where you have a stick for leverage and you put the larger shaft, which I don't have, but you can imagine here, and then use that stick for leverage to propel your hunting shaft at the uh, animal that you're hunting. And, and what that does is that increase in leverage uh, increases the velocity of, of a dart shaft and expands the range and the distance at which it can be propelled. And for people who, uh, archaeologists who actually replicate this ancient technology uh, and practice using a, a throwing stick and a dart shaft, they can be very accurate and it can be an eff a very effective hunting weapon. So what I'd like to do now is to move on and show you some of the other tools that were being made and used and discarded at West Athens Hill and tell us about what people were doing there and tell us about the people themselves. So this is the most common tool at the site. These are called end scrapers. And if you look closely, you can see that they all have a slightly rounded upper end. That's the working edge or the bit. And then that tapers down in a fan shape to a much more narrow uh, 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 a point at the bottom. And the reason for that is that these tools were hafted. And so we've got another replicate here, a copy, a modern copy. And so here's the end scraper. And that taper at the base allows it to be inserted into a bone or wood handle. And when you do that, that allows you to increase through leverage, that allows you to increase the pressure that's placed on the working edge of the tool as you're either pushing or pulling it uh, across the surface that you're working. Now the question is, what were these very common tools used for at Paleo Indian sites? And if you went to Alaska or Northern Canada and visited a hunter-gatherer society then, 100 or 150 years ago, women were still using these tools on the coast to process hides from seals and in the interior to process hides from caribou. Uh, and you would use this tool to scrape off any tissue on the inside of the hide or perhaps scrape off the hair on the outside of the hide. So this, there's historical evidence that these tools were traditionally used by women uh, to uh, do hide working for clothing manufacture in particular. Uh, and uh, archaeologists have actually used uh, microscopic useware analysis of the bits on these tools that are found at Paleo-Indian sites and confirm that the wear patterns on those tools indicates that they were indeed used for uh, working hides normally. And so, um, so that tells us how the tools were being used, but it also tells us in all likelihood about who was here at the site. The hunting weaponry was typically made and used by men in hunting and gathering societies, but end scrapers like this were traditionally in northern hunting and gathering societies used by women for clothing and tent manufacture. And so it tells us that both, both genders, it gives us gender information, both men and women were visiting this site and almost certainly children as well. Uh, the other thing I want to point out, out about this, this particular tool is the end scrapers before moving on is if you look at them and the stone that they're made on, most of it is the gray-green Norman Skill chert that outcrops right at West Athens Hill. But some of these end scrapers, like these two here, are made of a very different stone called uh, Western Onondaga chert that outcrops west of Rochester in New York. And then this other group of end scrapers down here, these red and brown end scrapers, those are made of a different fine grained stone called jasper, which outcrops in the middle Delaware Valley over 100 miles south of here, north of Philadelphia. And so these different stones are being quarried from other locations besides West Athens Hill. They might have been uh, given to the people at West Athens Hill by people in those where those other outcrops are, or just as likely these people were actually visiting those outcrops during their seasonal travels. And this tells us how mobile these, these uh, Paleo-Indian peoples were 
probably in part because of the highly seasonal nature of the climate at that time. So the stone tools are telling us not just what these people were doing at West Athens Hill, they're also telling us about the people themselves and their life way. Uh, I want to show you uh, one more tray of artifacts and uh, start out with these pieces here. Uh, they are uh, called side scrapers and they're a very common tool. Uh, also that you'll find on these Paleo-Indian sites. And if you wanted to make a side scraper, it's very simple. You take a big flake and take a little hammer stone and just go around the edges, bink, 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 and knock flakes off. And what they're, what they're doing there is it's not, the purpose is not to sharpen that edge, but to create an edge that is best suited to a particular kind of cutting or scraping task. If you want a sharp artifact, all you need to do is take a flake, and the edge on that flake is going to be very sharp. But they're designing tools for specific tasks. The last uh, artifact that I'd like to show you is actually fairly uncommon at sites like this. And if you look at it closely, you can see that in plan view, it's got a stout pointed tip. It's very narrow, and it also tapers down at the bottom. And if you look at it in cross section, it's thick up here with that stout tip. And it's actually been made thinner by driving a flake off the bottom of this tool. And this tool has been found at other Paleo-Indian sites. And um, it's clear by design that that pointed tip is intended for uh, a, 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 a function that involves working on some hard material and microwear analysis of those tips shows that these tools are being used to work bone or wood. And so we have examples of the kinds of things that they might have been uh, working with this. So here's a caribou bone and here's a piece of caribou antler. And what you could do is cut this up and then use this tool to score a deep groove in that, and that's a way to split apart the bone and the antler uh, because you can then create things like awls and sewing needles from that bone, uh, which can then be used, for example, for uh, sewing clothing. So this is a tool that was used to make other kinds of tools of, uh, of organic material, bone or wood, in all likelihood. And that's uh, also tells you about the nature of the archaeology at the West Athens Hill site because um, what we have here are the stone tools, but what these people wore, the various kinds of bone tools that they made and used, uh, none of that is preserved But because the soils in New York are so acidic that after 13,000 years, all of that has disappeared. And so what you're left with at the archaeological site is the stone tools and the debris from manufacturing those tools. Uh, and uh, it becomes even more of a detective story because uh, you're trying to figure out what else they're doing there that didn't, uh, that didn't just involve stone tools. How long was the excavation of West Athens Hill? Uh, that's a good question. They were working there in the summer and it was run by uh, uh, Bob Funk who be later became the state archeologist of New York and he worked for a couple of months for four years during the mid and late 1960s. And again, what animals were they hunting at this site? Well, um, most archeologists think that they're probably uh, most commonly hunting caribou, as you see in this exhibit, uh, that's a migratory animal, and they could have hunted them either by intercepting them along their seasonal migration routes, or uh, they could have literally followed them uh, uh, for portions of their migratory route and, and hunted them that way. Uh, there's almost certainly other animals that they were hunting and perhaps trapping in the exhibit. There's actually an Arctic hare hanging off that uh, little birch tree there. And so that's, that's another subarctic animal that was probably living in New York at that time. Um, uh, but it, again, we, we rarely see the food remains of these people preserved, so we don't know the full range of animals that they were probably hunting. One of the uh, questions that everybody wonders about was, were these Paleo-Indian peoples hunting the mastodon that were there at the same, same time as they were 13,000 years ago? 
And um, that's an open question. We found lots of fossil macedon remains in New York, but we've never found evidence, direct evidence of actual hunting of mastodons. There is one site in Western New York where Paleo-Indian tools have been found next to a fossil, uh, an Ice Age fossil deposit that contains mastodon remains, and it might be a situation where they're actually harvesting ivory uh, from mastodon tusks from mastodons that died at that salt spring. Uh, uh, this is called the Hiscock site in Genesee County. And one more, if you're okay with that. Sure. How did the scientists at the museum collect the stone tools? That's a great question, and they did it very systematically. They excavated in five-foot squares, and usually when you're excavating an archaeological site, you're, you're excavating in small squares like that because in archaeology, context is everything, so you want to be able to know where on the site you found an artifact. You measure the depth at which it was found, and you also reference the particular square that would have its own number as to where you excavated it. And that allows you to reconstruct after the excavation where artifacts have been found on the archaeological site. Uh, if you have other questions, you can reach me through my email account. You can go to Research and Collections on the New York State Museum. Look for Jonathan Lothrop. Send me an email, and I'll be happy to correspond with you. And, uh, and if you're interested, point you to other uh, reading sources about the, both this site and these early peoples in general, the first peoples to inhabit uh, Ice Age New York 13,000 years ago. Thanks for your time.